I was a huge spender, big spender. I had a lot of friends at the bigger firms. I always liked nice things. I always was not scared to work for nice things. I was out of my fucking mind. So my mom said rich people are greedy. My dad said poor people are lazy, and I'm in the middle. Did you always have this sort of entrepreneurial streak where you're like, didn't matter, you're, just, you're a whatever it takes guy? I studied the industry. I read every single thing I could on the industry, everything. Got right out of the gate, take off like a rocket? No, 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 not okay, at all. No, happen. not at all. Because right out of the, I got sued on October 20th. This was mental and emotional torture. I think a little bit of bullying is good for you. The guys that make it to the top, somebody bullied them at some point. No one gets bullied more today in the world than the present. This guy's the ultimate counterpuncher, right? I thought some of the things they were really just big mistakes. Would you rather have a private company spy on you or the government spy on you? I think with China, the bigger problem is the lack of respect for intellectual property. If there was a one piece of advice you could give to Donald Trump, what do you think that would make him even more effective? China's quiet. Mm. That's all I'm saying. Hey guys, JB here. The wolf is in the house in the wolf's den. I, I am really excited because I have an awesome, awesome guest. It's someone I respect tremendously for a number of reasons. Um, short story. Emigrated from Iran in the revolution, fled. I don't blame the fuck. <laughs> and then serves in the military, the 101st Airborne. Wow. All well, due respect. And then Patrick Bet David then came out, built a successful, you know, big time entrepreneur and became famous from the, uh, was it the 92nd? Uh, Life of an entrepreneur, yeah. 90 seconds. Yeah. Unbelievable. So let's look at it. I have so much I want to ask you, right? Um, First of all, about growing up in Iran. I'm, you know, it's like one of these little black holes. Like I always say, you know, like from my movie, I'm, I'm a household name everywhere, but Iran and North Korea pretty much, right? But I think they actually know me in Iran, not North Korea. So first of all, what was it like? Do you remember? I mean, you were pretty Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Didn't you, sp you spoke in Iran like a year ago or something like that. Was I was supposed to speak in Iran. And what happened was it right when Trump got elected, it, it, the, the whole dynamic changed and the economy crashed and they it just, it, it, it was this close. Probably not a bad idea. I know. The I fact know. that you stayed here. But yeah, I mean, I remember all of it. I remember living there. Uh, uh, I was born uh, October 1878. So revolution started in 78 and the Shah was in exile end of January uh, 1979. So right. I lived there 10 years. Uh, you know, I remember being bombed on 167 times on a single day. One of the stories I'll tell you is pretty wild. We're, we're leaving Tehran. Tehran's the capital. Right? And, so, we didn't, just, just, wasn't it like an amazing place though, like before? Are you kidding me? It was this, unbelievable, In right? the 70s, you have Burma, yeah. Cuba, and Iran were the top three countries in the world for tourism. Right, right. Iran, I mean, Sinatra used to go there. The Wide the, open, unbelievable, absolute, beautiful women. All the yeah. Time. The ambassador of Iran to U.S. dated Elizabeth Taylor. That, that should tell you something right there, like it. what it was like. So, so I was born, lived there 10 years. War happened, was pretty wild. And uh, six weeks after Khomeini died, uh, we escaped. We went to Germany, lived there for a couple of years at a refugee camp, uh, right in Erlangen. West Germany. West Germany. Ramstein yeah, Air Force Base, so you, that whole area. Absolutely. It's so, it's so wild you're telling me that. So I was right next to a military base, and I would always sneak in. And one time we went a little bit too much. You were blowing stuff up, but it was like you shouldn't be here. But we had a great time seeing these guys blowing stuff up. Maybe that's one of the reasons why I got inspired to go into the military later on. What? what so you were there when Khomeini was in power? Right? I was. Yeah. So, so you were. You were. What? How old were you when the Shah was deposed? I was just. I. I was born. So you have no. Okay. No, I have no memories of Shah. So you don't know Khomeini. the. Okay. So what was it like when you were like? Do you remember? Like, was there anything like? Uh, did you feel oppressed there, or you just too young? You're Christian, right? So you're not Muslim, I am. right? Yes. Was it a problem for you being a Christian in you know a sect in, you know, in a very like sort of what sect is that of, of Muslim that ran? Is it different sects or? There's yes, one? there are. There's Muslim. There's Baha'i. There's a lot of different ones. So by the way, Baha'i, they're not for Baha'i as well. Baha'i is almost like. Uh, uh, how do I put it? Imagine like an LDS or Jehovah to Christianity. Right, right. Uh, or how they look Christianity to, to Judaism, like how Jews look at Christianity. Uh, but yeah, you know, I remember clearly, you couldn't tell people you were Christian. People would ask me, what religion are you? So I'd tell, ask my dad, I don't know. And th that's what we were told. You know, you tell people you, you don't know what religion you are. So what you're, so what, you were like a mix, what you, you, so what's the whole, give me the whole family tree, because it's a crazy. So mother's side, they're 100% communists. Uh, they believed in communism. Their Bible was Karl Marx. That's they, they swore by Karl Marx. So, what, what was that? So, you know, it was this whole idea about the fact that rich people are greedy. All they care about is money. You know, they put people to work and, you know, they sit at the top, cash the checks, big belly, and everybody else is doing the work. So they hated rich people passionately. So basically, you're one of those people that when like, they say you develop the beliefs of your parents, you go the exact opposite way. You're the exact opposite That's way. right. I'm the exact. <laughs> but you know, my, my, my dad on the opposite side, he said... Uh, 
uh, uh, poor people are lazy. So my mom said rich people are greedy. My dad said poor people are lazy. And I'm in the middle. By the way, all the debates they had, no debate you've ever seen on television comes close to the mm-hmm. debates my mom and dad had. I mean, it was flying plates and things breaking. It was entertaining at its best. You know what they say, like in, you know, in com, I know a lot about, I, I, so I have a great story. So I dated a Russian girl back, you know, many years ago, famous Russian, who's the first Miss Soviet Union. You know who her boyfriend was before me? Cyrus Palevi. It was the Shah's grandson. Which Come was, on. I just swear to God. Yeah, really? Yeah, yeah, she was engaged to him. And then what they, year was this? This is 2000, so the late 99, Got 2000. It. We were together three years, hated each other. Somehow we made it three years, God knows how. Okay, But, <laughs> you, know, but, but you know, the whole thing with Russia was like, they'd say, communists, like, we'll keep pretending to work if you keep pretending to pay me worthless rubles, yeah. right? So it's like the whole like lack of work, no motivation, it's like, you're not really, if you can't achieve anything on the communism, right? So, so, your, so your mother was basically the idea that, you know, everyone should be equal, workers of the world unite, right? And your dad was like, fuck it, that's, I don't like lazy people, I wanna- A hundred percent. I mean, you said it best, just like that, a hundred percent. Clash of ideas there. And did they stay married? Absolutely and not, <laughs> they got divorced twice. <laughs> They got divorced after uh, uh, my sister was two years old, then they got remarried, then I was born, and then they got divorced 20 years later. I don't get that. So, like, I've been married a few times. Like, I, I, how the fuck could you marry the same woman again after she tortures you, or vice versa, right? I mean, it's, wow. It's like a love-hate it's, relationship, Well, right? in the Middle Eastern culture, it's the guilt aspect of it. It's guilt. You, have, you know, I, I can't believe you did this to her. I can't believe you're leaving her stranded. So... The guilt gets in, and you say, "You know what? I, maybe I'm gonna try this one more time." <laughs> and so, did they? Did the second time a charm or no? Absolutely not. Oh <laughs> more my broken God. plates. Let me put it to you this way: When they got a divorce, when they got a divorce, it was eighty nine, ninety. When my dad served the divorce paperwork while we were in Germany at the refugee camp, my dad was in the U.S. He served my mom the divorce paperwork. While we're there, and my mom got the divorce paperwork, my parents were in the same room for twenty years. They were. They would not be in the same room for twenty years. So I'm getting married. And both of them are expecting to come to my wedding. I said, you got, what makes you think you come into the wedding? They said, no, we're coming to your wedding. I said, I'm not doing this. I said, here's how we're going to do it. I need you to come to my apartment complex. This is years ago. I said, I need you to come to my place. You two need to sit together, talk to one another, and then you'll come to the wedding. Then you get the invitation. Right. And they said, we're not doing this. I said, then that's no problem. You don't need to come to the wedding. So then they call back. They said, we'll do it. They came to my house. It was the most awkward hour and a half of them sitting there. But I said, as long as you guys are good, then they came to the wedding. So 20 years. Wow. All right. So so you had this like sort of yin yang, right? And then when did you come to the United States? November 28, 1990. Okay. And so how old were you then? You were- 12. 12 years old, right? 12 years old. And where'd you, where'd you settle? For, for- uh, Granada Hills. Granada Hills, California. Okay. So and- about an hour and a half from here. And well, so how was your English, your English obviously flawless now. So how, when you, by the time you got it, did you speak English well from being in West Germany or you still struggle with it? I took, I took EFL, which is English as my fifth language because you got, we got Armenian, Assyrian, Farsi, German, English. So your first is Farsi, right? Is first, that- is, uh, first is uh, probably Armenian, Assyrian, because that's what my parents spoke. Right. And then it's Farsi because it's the country I lived in. Then it's Germany, then it's English. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you, so so, how proficient though was your English though? When you when was not, it was not it, at all. Not so good. it was tough when you got here. I mean, listen, Weddings Day, right? Remember Gilligan's Island? Yeah, yeah. I went to school. They said, so what, what kind of shows you watch? Gilligan's Island. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not silent. Government. English is a by the way, it's a tough language, right? It's not, yeah, it's yeah. not like because it's a lot of silent you know, letters. It's well, listen, it's not phonetic. like Assyrian. When you when you hear Assyrian speak, you literally think people are fighting with each other. Kepo, spila, move out. All this, you know, it's not the most attractive. Sometimes you wonder how Assyrians talk dirty to their girls, you know. <laughs> so, hey, so are you married now? By the way? I am married now. How long are you married for? Next week will be ten years. Okay. Uh, me too, ten years as Seriously. well. Yeah, yeah, same woman, uh, almost eleven years. Yeah, now. I met your wife last year. Yeah. Awesome. That's and, cool. And what? And um, kids? Three kids. Three kids. Seven, five, and a three-year-old. Two boys and the youngest is a girl. All right, so let's take this in order now. Right. So okay, so you you come here, you're twelve years old, right? Mm-hmm. No money, you know, family, right? You, you have, no, no one's got money, yep. right? You're just getting started. You're in Granada Hills. You have to learn the language, right? So what did you do? You, did you always have this sort of entrepreneurial streak where you was like, did it matter? You're, just, you're a whatever it takes guy. And so, you know, how did it, you transform from that to who you are? You, you know, what's crazy is, you know, when I was 11 years old in Germany, I'm at this refugee camp and this, this one family comes in, the Czechoslovakian family, last name is Staff. The, the son's name is Jan. The daughter's name is Katarina. 
Katarina was dropped at Gorgeous. She was 10, I was 11. I knew that somehow. Yes, yes. <laughs> she's 10, I'm 11. Right. And I'm looking at this girl. I'm like, I like this girl. So I find out Jan likes the Super Nintendo, okay? So I said, okay, I'm not a big fan of Super Nintendo, but I'm a fan of your sister. So we got to figure <laughs> something out. So that summer, I went to the local swimming pool in Germany, in Erlangen. And you know, in Germany, they drink a lot of beer. Uh -huh. I said, look, you know, there's a lot of beer bottles here. If I collect these beer bottles for you and I bring it to you, what are you going to give me? He says, I'll give you five Fennec. So the owner and I broke a deal, brokered the deal at 11 years old. I calculated how many bottles I needed, which was 5,000. I brought the bottles to him. He gave me 250 marks. I went to Kaufauf. I bought the Super Nintendo. I brought it back to the refugee camp. Jan played Super Nintendo. I played with his sister. So from it's that- It's amazing what- the, 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 Women <laughs> have so much power, right? Never changes. <laughs> but I would tell you, you know, in school, I was a 1.8 GPA kid. I worked, uh, I was always uh, tall, so- I lied on my age and I was right. working and telling them I was 16, 17. My first job was at Hagen Daz as a 14 year old kid. So always trying to find a way to make money. Right. And when did you have your first real, like, uh, so you know, you know, working, I, you know, it, I guess up to the age, I was always an entrepreneur myself, right? But I never really excelled the jumps, like, like, hot, like that drove me crazy to work for an hourly wage. But when did you have your first like entrepreneurial experience where you realized that, you know, hey, I could be in business for myself, even something stupid like a lemonade stand. Did you have anything that was the first anchor experience for you? So I went to school with two backpacks. One of them was books. The other one was hats I would buy uh, from a 99 cent store. And these hats I bought, sports teams were teams that were terrible. So like the Clippers at the time, San Jose Sharks, the right. Mighty Ducks. These are no one's gonna, no one's gonna follow right. these guys. But I would buy the starter hats for 99 cents and I would sell them for seven bucks. And finally, my principal caught me and they said, why do you come to school with two backpacks? But your, your GPA doesn't reflect the kid that would come to school with two backpacks. So wait, what year was this now? This is uh, 1994. The Clippers sucked, right? right? Clippers yeah. sucked yeah. back then. They had Danny Manning. They couldn't make the playoffs. They needed me to play for their teams oh, and I have no clue how to play basketball. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, so, all right, so that's, that, by the way, doesn't surprise me, right? That you, um, you know. The buying hats for a buck of 99 cents. I mean, I did that on the beach with ISIS, right? I mean, this class. So, what you were, how old at that time? Uh, 1994, 15, 16 years old. So, like, you know, for me, I, I'll tell you this. I had an experience when I was 16 years old. I went down to the beach. I think you probably know the story, right? And I started selling ISIS blanket to blanket. And the first day, like, I made 100 bucks in cash. And back then, I think minimum wage is a buck and a quarter. I mean, it changed my life in terms of, you know, what. Everything I thought about money, hard work, and you know, it, it really was the really the beginning. I had stuff before that, but that was the foundation for who I was because I had. I mean, that, you know that feeling like when you like just you know you do something and it works and you get a pile and you're like, fuck, man, you're like you know. So was that how you felt like when you you know did you have a oh, did you make money doing that? What was the most you ever made with the hats? You know, listen, a hundred dollar day was a lot of money. Massive. You have a hundred dollar, you're like, are you kidding me? I made a hundred bucks today. Dude, you, uh, so what, what was the area? I'm sorry, what, what you said it was what? 95. Okay, so yeah, that's that's like like 250 today probably, or, you know, but also you're a and kid. And it's cash, and, and it's cash, no taxes, right. and you're a kid, and you're like, wait a minute, I can go buy baseball cards, I can go buy basketball cards. The best part for me was that the beach money was in fucking singles. So it was like, it was like 500 bucks was like this big. Yes. It's like more better than I like bet. $500 bills. Right? This is what beach, by the way? Where, where? Jones Beach in New York. Okay, got it. So I, I was a vendor there and I, I put myself through school like that. It was just, it wasn't the money. It was just the experience of like, you know, and I had, I hired three kids to work for me that sold puka shells. Oh, I mean, I had a whole freaking thing going, but let's talk about you. So you, you start with the hats, right? You have this experience. You're already, now you're starting to make money. You have a girlfriend or in this point? Yeah, I, I, I was not, no, I didn't have a girlfriend at that point. At 96, I had a girlfriend, but not at 95. So you're making money though, and you feel I good. am making money, oh yeah. I, and with this point now, so, you know, I mean, I could only imagine, like, you know, you show up, speaking a different language, right? Was it, we, was like, were people, were the kids nice to you, or did they resent you? Did they, you know, I mean, like, you know, I, I would say it's more uh, making fun of you is what it was. You know, the whole, uh, you're, you're a phobe, you know, fob, fresh off the boat, you know, yeah. you, you don't know how to pronounce the language. You had a lot of... This. Some, was, it, was it cruel or... You're a big guy, right? So, I mean, I think people be scared to be Yeah. Funny. But, like, was it sort of like, was it fun? Like, they were nice about it? Were they assholes? You know? No, absolutely. Kids all could of be them. assholes. You, you get you know? all of them. Yeah. You, get all, but you know, for me, I, I look at it in a different way, man. I think a little bit of bullying is good for you. I, I think to get bullied a little bit is... Uh, at least for me, when I study the guys that make it to the top, somebody bullied them at some point. And they have a memory of that person or a chip or something. Whether it's an older brother, older sibling, a friend, a coach, 
a strong father, a cousin, somebody was a little bit bullied. It could be with words, it could be with a lot of different things. So, so it's interesting you take, cause you know, it's funny, like, I mean, like I hate bullies. And I think as adults, we all hate bullies. And probably when you're, you know, an airborne ranger, you probably would fucking kick the shit out of any bully you saw, No right? doubt about it, yeah. So I guess, I guess you're saying like with it to a, up to a point, right? Like there's, I think it crosses over to when it gets really destructive to someone. But I think what you're saying is a little bit of like, you know, you know, in the sense of like, you know, having to sort of deal with like the world's not a perfect place. Well, People yeah. are gonna be assholes and sort of develop a little muscle and you know, a bit of armor is not the end of the world. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, like, you gotta realize, no one gets bullied more today in the world than the president. Right. Oh my God. Oh my. Okay, so you see, yeah. there is nobody that gets bullied more. So Disgusting. Here, so here's a rule that we have yeah. in our family. When I sit at night and I talk to my boys, my, my uh, five-year-old and my seven-year-old, I ask him, what do we do as a family? Lead, respect, improve, love. Okay, great. I said, what do we pray for? If you pray, what do you pray for? Courage, wisdom, tolerance, understanding. Great. I said, do we bully? No. Do we get bullied? No. Let me tell you the sto a story of what happened here. A month and a half ago, my wife calls me. She says, hey, babe, uh, Patrick just got kicked out of soccer practice. I said, for what? She says, he punched a kid in the face. I said, what do you mean punch a kid in the face? He punched a kid in the face. I said, come on. I'm, so I'm telling you, baby, he, you're on speaker. Talk to him. So I said, Tico, did you really punch a kid in the face? I did, daddy. I did punch him in the face. Why'd you punch him in the face? Because he punched me first in the stomach. So I just did what you told me to do. Hey, I yeah, don't want to get bullied. I'm, I'm all for that. So I called the school. I called it a, a practice facility. And I said, listen. Uh, Self-defense. What right? happened here? And they said, well, you know, your son kicked the, uh, punched the kid in the face. And that's why we kicked him out. I said, you guys watch a videotape. He says, no, I said, I need you to watch a videotape because you just kicked my kid out of practice. If he didn't do it, I want to get some war done. So they called me back. They said, we apologize. Your son got punched first, then right. he reacted. There you go. So that part of it to me is you got to be strong here because if you're not, people will bully you, uh, especially in the business world. When you're coming up, you're going to be bullied. No doubt about it. I guess, I guess for me, I, you know, I was fortunate. I wasn't really bullied as, as a kid, but I, I know some kids that were, and it can't. It's like, you're right, you can't be a pussy. You gotta be able to, you know, stand up for yourself. But kids can be fucking cruel sometimes, you know? So I think there's gotta worse be some- adults, by the way. Yeah, much yeah. worse, especially girls. <laughs> yes. I, I had a daughter and she was like, she was a pretty girl and she had a one year, really tough year where like all the- <laughs> With you or with, uh, with the boys? No, with all the, no, with all the girls not uh, liking yeah, yeah. her, you know? They're vicious, right? So, and she, uh, and actually, and and interesting enough, it changed up for the better. So you know, valid point you made. Um, I think she realized that like it was a shift for her that there was a lot more to her than the way she looked. She started focusing on her studies. Now she just graduated from NYU grad school. Come on, f f f you know, summa cum laude. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think your points well taken. I guess the only thing is like if it crosses a line, then it's like it's you know. I, I don't think it's good, but a little bit I, of, of, you know, you can't go through life and yeah. slide through the raindrops. Yeah, right? I'll give you an idea. When I was in the military, okay, if you can't handle sarcasm, military's not for you. Everything was about sarcasm. Everybody was just poking, all the drill sergeant. Right. Hey, you got a girl back at home? I do. Guess what she's doing right now? What's right. she doing right now? She's you, banging you, Jose. Yeah, <laughs> she's banging Jose, your best, who's Poncho. your best friend. <laughs> right. He would never do that. Uh, he, she's yeah. on top of him right now. Right. She's, she's not even screaming your name. Yeah, she's screaming she's his moaning, name. right? Yeah, she's moaning. <laughs> so this, this was mental and emotional torture. And so you saw that and you watch your peers. You're like, oh my gosh, he can't handle that. He, he cracked, he broke. He, and, and a big part of life is a tryout to see if you can stay strong during these times to get to the next. I firmly believe that because you, know, you go into business when you go into business, I mean, nobody liked you. Okay. You're like, hey, hey, what are you doing in New York? Who is this guy coming up? You know, we don't like somebody coming up this quickly, so someone's going to try to bully you. No and doubt. Uh, I, well, for me, by the way, you know, when I was, you know, I was approached by the, by the mob a bunch of times, you know, and um, I had private security forces and stuff back then, but. I think the one thing I had going for me is that, of course, I was under investigation. They fucking scared to get involved because then they would like to get it, would draw attention to them. But they were on Wall Street back in the day. They were pretty active, trying to muscle their way into firms and you know, and so on and so they forth. They were coming to you. Oh yeah, like more than once. Yeah, they trying came. trying to muscle you. Uh huh. For to come in and yeah, because listen, I was. If you think about it, what I was doing was the perfect money laundering mm. machine for the mob because. I, I could essentially make anyone money in a stock trade yeah. and have them take, give me back cash. You could actually legitimize cash through stock. And that happens a lot on Wall Street. So, you know, I, I don't know if it happens as much now because of, you know, it's just more difficult with computers and stuff. But back in the day, fuck. You, I mean, the 60s and 60s before I was even there, I heard stories where like, 
like there was so much theft of stock certificates and she was just like the fucking wild west. You wouldn't even believe it, right? Now this is not just penny stocks. This is no, stocks, period. No, everything, the, the whole yeah. market before. So, you know, back in the 60s, believe it or not, it was no electronic transfers of securities. If you bought and sold stocks, people fucking run across the street with physical certificates and, you know, just, just the, like, I think they would say that like, if you actually looked to see where the certificates, they weren't, <laughs> really there, like a lot of shit was being stolen and yeah. laundered and stuff. So that was back. Then it all changed in the seventies. Everything went. It was, I think, a day called. It was one day where everything like, went electronic and a lot of shit was uncovered. But anyway, so yeah, you know, I did have pressure at some points. I had a private security guy, you know, sort of that I had hired that kind of intervened. But eventually, I was under investigation. So they, they were scared to get like you don't get involved with me. How was it for you in the streets at that time? Like when you go to a restaurant, how was the you know, when you were coming up, how did the streets treat you? Like when other brokers saw you from Morgan Merrill, other places? Well, I mean, I was treated well by them because in the sense that I was like an enigma in, in that, um, like, you know, boiler room, right? Sure. That was not accurate. Like that, that was, guy worked for me and it wasn't really accurate in the sense that my guys would go to a place and get sneered. It wasn't really like that so much. I don't think they went to the city that much, by the way, but, but it was really, for me, it was more like I was a huge spender. Big spender, and I had a lot of friends at the bigger firms. So there wasn't like a lack of respect, as much of a lack of understanding. You spent on them at the bigger no, firms? Just, no, no, no. What, I, was going, not. I was going out into the city a yeah. lot, right? And then we'd have big tables and hookers and drugs and insanity. Like at the movie, it was like almost an underestimate of what happened, right? <laughs> so the word spread all over Wall Street. I was well known. And I was well liked, and no, no one resented it. It was like sort of, it was no real clash of worlds, so to speak. It was more like an enigma. That guy said it was fucking mine. I was like, I mean, look, dude, my drug addiction was, I mean, you can't, have you ever been, in, I don't think you've been, have you ever had a drug problem? No. No. I, so, you know, for a bunch of years there, I was like just fucking wild, you know what I'm saying? So, was that known though in New York? Oh, yeah. So they knew you dude, partied hard. Dude, I would go to, it was a restaurant. So it was a famous restaurant too. It was a friend of mine, still so Mark Packer. Right, he owns Tao and he's very successful, right? He had a restaurant called Canistel's back in the day, which is the fucking place to be, right? In New York. In New York, okay. on 19th and Park, okay? And it was a great place, great looking crowd. He was an awesome dude. And I would go to Canistel's and like be four ludes deep and just like balancing off the <laughs> fucking walls and my bodyguard. No, you know, do you know Chuck Zito for the hell, head of the Hells Angels? He was my bodyguard. So he'd follow me around and so no fuck with me. But I was like, I was just out of my fucking mind, you know? And then, and then and it all made sense back. Then I got sober. I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, I look back, holy shit. How long was that, the, the, the whole 10 run? years? 10 years. Ten, I, I was heavy, massive drug use for about eight solid years of just massive quaalude use and about three years of heavy cocaine use, right? And that's sort of like, you know, it, it just let's say, like, you know, cocaine doesn't really suit well with me. It turns me into an animal. Like, I do terrible things. Ter it makes me into a different, you know, I don't want to get so sexual here, but just say it brings out my perversions, <laughs> like most f men, it makes us into fucking beasts of, you know, whatever we are, right? The question I was going to ask you was a follow-up. I'm curious to know what you think about this. You know, when the first time the debate was between Nixon and Kennedy, Nixon froze, Kennedy didn't, and he became, right. you know, everybody's like, oh my God, this guy's more president. But before that, we didn't debate that way. It was radio. Right. So TV changed the game. Totally. Or who can communicate better, which totally. is why Bill Clinton became president, my or else George Bush Sr., yes. director of CIA with the kind of a resume you got. Are you kidding me? Thousand percent. There's no way in the world the governor of Arkansas would have beaten him if it was just stacked up resumes. Who goes against who, right? So do you think the current way of uh, uh, social media marketing, access to what we have, the way we see videos on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, do you think whoever delivers the message better wins? Do you think the talent plays a very big role today into becoming a president? I think Obama proved that the power of social media mobilizing voters, yeah. and he did a really great job of that while Romney didn't, right? That was a big, a big deal, right? I think Obama did a really good job. Um, the answer is yes. I mean, it's a reality. You have to be savvy. Trump is fucking, un I mean, this guy is, you know, I thought he was a little, I thought some of the things he did were really just big mistakes. And he turned out to be right. Like when he went so hard against the media, this guy's the ultimate counterpuncher, right? And, you know, with his tweets, I mean, he'll call out a grandma who says something. Like, I don't, I'm like, what the fuck is he doing? I'm like, Mr. President, you got some fucking better shit to go. And like a grandma said one bad thing. It's like that fucking grandmother should go rot in hell. She's a loser. She's a fucking loser. You know, loser grandma, right? You know, it's like no one gets away with it with the guy, right? But on some level, I, I, I don't, I mean, I, you know, you can't argue with success. My wife was 
approach very early on. She was like, I like, you know, she's a libertarian. My wife's a libertarian, right? And she was just very pro-Trump because it was more like, for me, it was more anti-Hillary. Was she be, was she before uh, you pro-Trump? Oh, yeah. So you came later on. You supported I, her later on. I never was, I never was pro-Hillary. It was never a shot, but I was, I was, listen, here's the thing. So They I, won when elections started. You have 16 candidates on the Republican side. Who were you excited about? I thought he about? would implode. I did not think he Who would. did you think had a chance? They won. I thought I thought Jeb Bush would oh, make it would, simply because the money would buy, guy, would buy yeah, out. I thought the, pa- the the family's pretty corrupt, and I thought they would sort of you know push it through, right? But when I, I it was a certain point in time, it came pretty obvious, right? And then when the so here was the interesting when the tape came out, right? With the only thing grabbed the pussy, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and then he just went fucking harder at them. I was like, oh my god, this guy. But it, you know, it's a diff- we live in a different world. And you know what? Here's what Trump is incredibly great at. He's incredibly great at crystallizing simple thoughts for people to understand. So true. Make America great again. He uses yeah. words. He repeats them again and again. I personally think that if he improved his communication like this much, he'd be even more effective. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't really know. This guy's being attacked like no other yeah. president has ever been attacked. So I wonder what I would do if I was being attacked as much as him, like I wonder if I would almost like say if even if the grandma from freaking Omaha, fuck you, grandma, you know, don't you dare say. I mean, because this guy's under assault. If if Trump like if Trump rescued ten babies out of the let's say yeah he and he slaughtered them afterwards or he's gonna you know, he did it for evil purposes. Yeah. So it's pretty fucked yeah. up, you know. And all I care about is this. I'm I'm very concerned about things like the budget deficit. Mm-hmm. So, like there's so I, I have real concerns here. Not for me, you know, honestly. Things have a way of saying they kick the can down the road. I, I, don't, I don't think it's going to impact our lives, but I think it's going to impact our kids' lives. I think the things that are happening right now for millennials mm-hmm. and, and that people are coming after, I, I don't know what the fuck they're going to do with this massive deficit that keeps growing. And does it really concern you? It, do, it does concern what me. What part of it? The debt we owe to China or well, is it more just China, the total just the, deficit? Just the total debt. 22 the trillion. Total de- de- because I don't see, I, I think I'm a pretty smart guy mathematically. I don't really see a way out of it without some realignment of currency and global trade, meaning if somehow the, it was something happened with the U.S. dollar, but that would be called a, have a cataclysmic effect. So I don't really see how it ends. The problem is, is that, you know, it's almost like too big to fail. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is know, America it, it, too big to fail? Big is that kind of how you're yes, looking at it? Yeah, so though, they, keep, listen, they keep printing more money, right? And they, the Fed expands the balance sheet, right? And it, they sort of kick the can down the road. And the, I guess the idea is that if the economy grows so rapidly, mm-hmm. then the ta- by cutting taxes, the economy grows rapidly. So that even though it's lower tax rates, the overall intake is much lower. That's the theory. And eventually you pay down the deficit. So how much are you following right now with the 5G thing that's taking place with Huawei, with China, with all that? Are you following any yeah, of that stuff? Yeah, of course I do. Yeah, so yeah. what do you think about that? What do you think about the... Uh, so, so let me ask the question in a different sure. way. So you got the tariffs that's taking place, Right. Where there is China, obviously Mexico tariff was more about the immigration and the wall. Right. Canada tariff was accidental because he was right. trying to get it to right. China. He wasn't really dealing with Canada. But this tariffs, is the issue really tariffs to you? Is it really 5G? Is it really, what is the thing that you're most concerned about? The biggest thing, okay, so I, I think he's 100% right that the trade deals that were cut for the U.S. over the last 20, 30 years were just Fucking asinine. I mean, honestly. Both sides, oh, by the way. It, like, almost like it was at a guilt, like to give away the store yeah. like that, right? Um, that being said, I think with China, the bigger problem is the theft of IP, a lack of respect for intellectual property and theft of IP, and especially, um, you know, high tech stuff. And I think that's a really major issue. So it's not just about trade imbalances, so to speak, that. You know, they, you know, and I've done business in China and I've spoken in China. And, and by the way, you know, one thing you could say about Chinese people, they're fucking peaceful. When did they attack anybody? Never. They don't attack people. And so, so look at it. They're not a military, even though they're building up the military. When has China had committed a war? They, you know, they've been attacked. They've never really attacked people. So they're, they're kind of a peaceful, they commit like economic war in some respect. Like I've been around Africa where they're very aggressive and mm-hmm. buying stuff mm-hmm. and they don't always treat the countries, let's say they don't always, uh, in, they invest in a country, it's more about grabbing out than putting back. At least that's the narrative that I hear from countries, you know, and I, I you know, I don't have the, the proof of it. It seems like they sort of are pulling out resources and not really building infrastructure. So they build infrastructure that's only robust enough to last as long as the last piece of metal comes out and <laughs> collapses on itself, right? So it's not long-term infrastructure. But the big thing I see with China is that 
they are stealing intellectual property. And I think that's the, especially in the high, the high tech era, I think that's the big danger. And without that, some check being put into place, I think it's a huge issue. And I think that Trump is right. And I think he's the first president to stand up. I don't just, you know, I don't think this spirals out of control much. I, I really, I maybe I'm wrong. I don't think it's going to end up in a full-blown long-term trade war. I think there'll be a reset. I think they'll come to terms in within the next six months. I really you do. You think so? I think so. I do. What, what I, do you think will be the cornerstone of that taking place? Like, what's going to cause that? Well, I think, that, listen, uh, it's, you know, Trump's, he had a classic statement, by the way. His classic statement was, like, he said to the, to the uh, Democrats, like, almost like, could you at least fucking lie for me and pretend to be on my side so I can negotiate more effectively? Like, a lot of what Trump does is posturing and negotiating and threatening and basic negotiations, right? You have to kind of see through some of his tactics, right? And I, I, I don't believe, I think he's smart enough to know. I know, but I know Mnuchin. I met him before in person. Mm -hmm. he's, he's not surrounded by idiots. He's surrounded by smart people. Everyone knows that, you know, the tariffs over the long term really are not a good thing. Okay, but that being said, you know, as a short-term punitive measure, as a negotiating tactic, I think it's important. I think he's doing the right thing. You can't, it, I don't think it was sustainable. With China, the, what they were doing was, is they're essentially exporting like crazy, putting up barriers. They, they have tariffs, they have barriers to import there, right? And if you want to do business there, you have to essentially have, it's got to be an operated by Chinese company. And that means your technology yeah. becomes open. They that's steal right. the technology. That's, that's the whole made in 25, uh, uh, made in it. China uh, 2025 yeah. plan that's that they have. That's a big problem. So what do you think about the whole speed of uh, 5G? The fact that uh, EU, US, South Korea, Australia is not going to have it ready till 2025. And China is saying they're going to have it ready by 2020. I, I think that number one, the 5G, right, it's based on the phones have to be ready. Apple won't even have a phone ready, I think, until 2020, right? So, like, right now on my phone, I have this thing. It's called 5G is <laughs> fucking scam, 5GE. You um, know what it's called. You yeah, know, you 5G know why evolution. They, it's nothing. It's, it's nothing. It's 4G. It's <laughs> just a, One day I'm like, what the fuck, 5G? <laughs> Where'd this come from, right? You know? So, from what I heard, right, they're, they're rolling out a couple of cities um, this year. I think the mass adoption is next year, right? That's supposedly what you they You talk say. about China? No, in the U.S. The U.S. is next year, I hear. U.S. is saying they're not going to be ready 5G till 2025. Really? Because I read an article. Is that true? I read, I read an article that said that they were testing it, I thought, in- 19 cities. In, yeah, in but next But small year. cities. I thought, it was LA, L, no, I, thought it was, I thought it was LA. I may have wrong. I don't know. Yeah, the, challenge is, the challenge you're having is with the trees because mm. it's not going through trees. So China, the way they came out with the 5G, so the biggest concern they have with 5G right now is U.S., if we land 5G contract, because we got 4G, that increased GDP by $100 billion. They're projecting 5G technology, if U.S. gets it first, is 3 million jobs and half a trillion dollars of GDP goes up if we get 5G. And so a, a big part of this, when you're looking at it, is saying, you know, Trump is a pretty brilliant negotiator. Why is he banning Huawei? Is he banning Huawei because they potentially could come into the U.S. Uh, economy and compete and take some of the market share away from Apple? You got three poster childs for each country. You got Apple is U.S., Samsung is South Korea, Huawei is China. So I think the problem with, with, with Huawei, is that pronounce Huawei? <laughs> Huawei, that's the right word, yeah, Huawei. Huawei, okay. So the problem with that, I think originally was that that the there was a suspicion that they were embedding code in their appliance, their phone, their computers that would allow China to basically spy, tap in. So it was a big issue. So it started with not allowing it to be involved in government organizations. Sure. That's how it started, sure. right? And then it spread from there, right? Um, so I think that that's the big concern is that there is things going on with their technology. They're embedding stuff you believe in that? there. I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, I think the Chinese are surveillance. I think it's a culture. If you go to, you know, you go to, have you been to China recently? No. It's fucking, they have shit there. Like they have technology all over this fucking cameras yeah. and shit, like yeah. facial recognition stuff. Like I saw this thing. It's like almost like the future. Where, like they can track you like in real time. They had this thing where a guy commits a crime. It was like a mock thing. Mm -hmm. And the police got the guy like within 15 minutes. Cause like they track the guy through yeah. facial. It's fucking like minority report. Like, you know, mm. the Tom, that, that movie, right? It's crazy. Shit. Let me ask you this. Though. Do you think us? Cause you know, your iPhone has 900 million active phones, right? Out of the 900 million active phones, 300 million roughly is out of China. Don't you think China kind of says, well, wait a minute, you're spying on us through Apple. Don't you think they can potentially say, well, what, maybe U.S. is China, you know, spying on us. Why are you so worried about us you know, spying on you? It's a good question. So I, I think that the perception, and by the way, you know, 
who fucking knows? I'm not a tech guy. I'm not a coder. I fuck around. I have coders here, right? I, yeah. I always fuck around. I walk by and I say, oh, you left out a fucking colon there. Put that on. I see him. What the fuck is on their screen? It's like the fucking Matrix, right? You know, like, what are you doing? You left out an apostrophe. Yeah, the fucking thing never worked. You know, these guys are brilliant young guys, right? And they code and stuff. And it's something that I never want to learn, right? It's like, you know, I came too late. I was born too, too early for that shit, right? But I, I think that who knows what back doors and trap doors the thing is, the difference I believe is that there's much more transparency in the U.S. And maybe I'm fucking naive, okay? Maybe for all the NSA has got a trap door built yeah. into every fucking phone. And listen, you know this, you know about the whole thing with the Sucksnet virus they put around the world with Israel they did yeah. there to like be able to shut people's electrical. So you know, I would always say like, you know, when I, my problem with the whole Russian meddling thing was. I was like, we fucking meddling everyone. I mean, just fuck. So Russia's meddling. Uh, what elections? We go back to Iran, Mogadishu, right? We <laughs> fucking like install wow. people yes. in all over the world. Yeah. I don't think that's a terrible thing. Like yeah. the U.S. has a foreign policy, and you know they're actually ex trying to exert their will. So this whole thing that Russian, like, we're trying to interfere. No fucking shit. They're trying to interfere with our election. They've always tried, and I think we always try to do it around the world too. So I don't yeah. think it's like the end of the world. I think what happened was, frankly, it's the old fucking the best defense is a good offense because Hillary, the dirty dossier, she says, fuck, let's deflect it away from me because I had this done by, you know, Fusion GPS with freaking Christopher Steele. So let's just say it's Trump colluded with Russia because this takes the burden off me, but now it's boomeranging back. So I don't really- it's a scary thought right there. It's yeah. going to be very scary. When it comes. So, so, then, so then would you rather have a private company spy on you or the government spy on you if you had a choice? A pro private company. Private, because it's purely profit-based. <laughs> <laughs> I think, it's, by the way, you fucking read that. Everybody looked at it that way, just intuitively. So I answered it intuitively, but yeah. that's, you're right. That's because, you know, I guess like the, their own selfish interest. It's well, like they, a prostitute. They want to sell it's me shit. honest relationship. They want to. Hundred want, bucks, boom. That's it. There's no sell, games. They just want to fucking yeah. sell me shit, put the right things in front of me. I always get nervous about, we, we, sit, we laugh, like we'll, my wife and I will talk about something. And next day, it's fucking like on my like uh, uh, advertising. Yeah. I'm like, oh my god! I, I I got nervous. I turned off my Alexa. I know it's probably stupid, but I turned the, the fucking bitch off. That, by the way. I got yeah. nervous because yeah. like yeah, I was like, what the fuck? Is this woman listening? To me? I was listening to me the entire time. And, and you know what? Like, and here's the thing, right? There is going to be a point, and I, I think it's coming soon, where like artificial intelligence really is. Gonna, you know, that moment of singularity, they call it, right? I think Raymond Kurzweil was a, coined that term. Maybe he didn't, but yeah. this idea that computers will become more powerful than people, and then who knows what the fuck's gonna happen then, right? But you think about it, you have every, you know, we're so, I rely on it, I'm sure you do too, right? My phone, right, we're all over, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's a scary thing because you, you are, I mean, I mean, think back before, so back in, like, it's not that long ago when, like, we were in a non-digital world. Like, I grew up in a non-digital world. You know, it used to be a great thing. You'd wait, you probably remember this, when it was like you were younger and you wait for a movie to come on TV. It was a big deal, like, on, you know, being the theaters, and if you missed it there, you wait two years and you'd see it on, like, a Sunday night. It was a, and now it's like, everything's instant this. It's, That's fucking, right. it's like a, a different fucking yeah. world, right? You know, and, and here's the, another thing. So, like, there's always unintended consequences. For a lot of stuff, like on, for example, like social media, you brought it up. It's a good point. So, what do you think about social media? Well, you know, on some level, it's great because on one point, it gives every person a voice, but it also gives every asshole a voice. Right? There's a lot of assholes out there. But here's the thing: I think the problem is more the algorithms that companies like Facebook use, where they show you more and more of what you like, so you end up in a fucking echo chamber. And I really wish that. I, I wish uh, I, I, you know, I sometimes I'm starting to really not like my news feed because it's the same. Sh I don't want to see people who always agree with me. I want to every day. I, I read the New York Times. I'll watch. Um, I don't watch CNN because it's fucking nonsense, right? But I'll watch one of the regular mainstream news channels and I'll watch Fox News because I want to see both sides. I want to hear what everyone yeah. is saying. I don't want to be in an echo chamber. What happens on social media is they'll if you start clicking on certain things, oh, he likes that. They show you more of that, and before you know it, it's a, it, it almost evolves. You disagree? The, you don't like that? I don't like that. I want. So I, you know they're trying to change that, by the way. I think it's the problem is it puts you in an echo chamber. You start to think everyone agrees with. With you and they don't. There's a lot of listen. There's a lot of really smart people who are liberal out there. Really normal, smart people. I don't agree with them. I love to debate with them about it. But 
people are entitled to have their views and, and have healthy debate. And what happens with social media is that you end up in an echo chamber and that's dangerous mm. where you're only seeing the shit. And I've seen it happen to myself, my wife's newsfeed, and she had to almost detach from it because she ended up in this ultra conservative by, not by, by choice, by accident. I think that's a big problem. Yeah, it's going to be funny to see what takes place here moving forward. What do you think about, so what do you think in terms of the next election? How, what do you, how do you think social media plays into the upcoming election? Well, I mean, I think Ron Paul changed the game. I think it's all about Ron Paul. Ron Paul changed the game in 04. 04, he raised $6 million on MySpace in 24 hours. It was a Guinness Book of World Record. Ron Paul, 69-year-old man, raises $6 million on MySpace in 24 hours. Obama sees this saying, if this guy can raise $6 million in 24, I'm going to raise $2 billion to be a president, become a two-term president. Look what happened. Right. right? So I think it's going to play a very big role. And it's funny how Facebook is facing so much backlash now where they're being forced to be more transparent and people are upset to say that, hey, uh, Facebook is not going to show what Trump's campaign is going to be doing, all this stuff, and they're kind of being open about it because they're forced to do that. And Trump's kind of holding them accountable. A lot of people are meeting with Facebook yeah. to see, are you guys going to be open or not? But I don't think uh, it's going to be much different. Look at, look at this, you know, a couple of guys that are coming up on the uh, Democrat side, right? They're coming up to become candidates. They're just doing social media better than the give rest me of the some, guys. Give me some Andrew care. Yang is coming out of nowhere. This guy's talking about universal basic income, saying let's give everybody a thousand dollars a month, one and a half trillion dollars a year. Why not? Is going to improve the economy. Let's just whether print money and give it to them. Whether they deserve it or not, right? What do you think about that? I think it's fucking the most stupid thing I've ever fucking heard. I mean, I mean, you know, listen. You, you, no matter what, life is very, and some things are very simple. If you give people something for nothing, they don't fucking value it. Okay. It's the same thing with, you know, I sell information products, yeah. right? If you underprice something, I've actually tried, it's, you know what, I want to be a nice guy. I'm going to just give this away very cheap. People won't use it because they don't invest their money. They don't, oh, whatever. They're not, they're not invested in it, right? right? Versus charging a higher price. And people say, oh, fuck, I put money. Well, I, I better do this. And I, I think by, you know, giving people money is, is idiotic, okay? You know, I, I, and I always, by the way, you know, I always, my parents, I grew up in a very liberal household, right? Obviously, I had very different views to my parents growing up, but- Even growing up. Oh, my God, yeah. Even I, growing up. From as far back- I, wow. I'll tell you, Sam. So my, what caused it? Well, I'll tell you a story. So when, back when I was 12, my brother, he's a fucking commie, right? And he went to this camp that was like a communist fucking camp, right? And I, you know, I idolized my older brother. So I was like, oh, I want to go to the camp too. And didn't really know what it was about. It was like a socialist fucking work camp, right? So I go there, right? And, I, and, I, and they say, okay- First thing you got to do is you got to share, you got to put your money in. I'm like, why? It's because we all pool our money. I'm like, they didn't fuck. say that. Yeah. I'm like, fuck that shit. I'm like, I don't want to do that. They fucking impound, I got in punished. They put me in a fucking like a lockdown situation, like, because I wouldn't share my fucking money. And I was like, dude, I was green. I'm like, why the fuck should I share my money with other people? Like, you know, it's like, and by the way, not that I, I think I didn't even work for it because I was already doing magic shows and shit, but I was like, so, I was so appalled. They threw me out. I actually got, I, I got, I had to leave the camp early. I got thrown out. And like, and so I always, as far back as I can remember, I always liked nice things. I always was not scared to work for nice things. And I think when my parents were amazing people, I love my parents to death, but I noticed some things about them. Like number one, brilliant, hardworking, educated, and fucking broke. So I'm like, what, wait a second. I'm like, okay, wait, so wait a second. So you can go to school, get degrees. They're both are CPAs. My mom's now even a lawyer. She mom and dad both CPAs. Both CPA. My wow. mom was a CPA back in the 50s, like in Mad Men. You remember? But when women weren't in the workplace, right? She was there. CPA was, in the 50s? Oh, yeah. And she was rocking and rolling. Brilliant woman, right? My dad was a CPA. And I remember when I was like 11 years old, I wanted a dirt bike. And I said, huh, I want a dirt bike. It was like 120 bucks. And they said, we can't afford it. I'm like. What, is, what, what the fuck? What do you mean? They're like, you guys are fucking accountants. What do you mean you can't afford? It? Like, we get my mom said, let me show you our budget. And she actually showed me the. F I was like, fuck. I was appalled. I was like, that's all you fucking. I was like, I felt like, I'm, how dare you? How old did you say you were? I was 12. 12 years 11, old. 11, 11 or 12, something like that, right? And, I, and they couldn't, and I couldn't have this dirt bike. And the same thing happened with an electric guitar I wanted. I played the guitars. Like they, you know, they, and I was like, fuck. And it just sort of you know, locked in this idea with me that there's something else. Now, let, let's talk about entrepreneurship. Right? You're, if you're a really well-known, well-respected entrepreneur, we could talk all day, the two of us, right? But I want to talk about entrepreneurship. Tell me about how you, you had a big break, right? Where you, where you, so you go to the army, you're fucking mad, man, right? You, and I respect you. Anyone that serves in the military, you that I have just fucking kudos for you, right? That's great, right? I, you, I really, no, I really, I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart, right? Um, but then you come out, mm -hmm. right? And 
Tell me your career and how that really started as an entrepreneur. Yeah, so I got out. I uh, uh, met a, uh, I want to be bodybuilder. That's what it was. I was going to go be the Middle Eastern Arnold. I was going to go win Mr. Olympia, go into Hollywood, marry Kennedy, be a governor. That was the plan, right? That's, that's the route I was going to take. Met a girl at uh, uh, Venice Beach, California. She was a broker at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. Okay. And we'd go out. She would always pick me up in a different car. And finally, I said, how do you make your money? She says, I'm the advisor to Laker players. That's what I do. I'm a Series 7, 66, the whole night. I said, how can I do it? She said, well, you need to have a four-year degree. Morgan doesn't hire without a degree. And I was looking for JT Marlin, but JT Marlin wasn't out ah. there. <laughs> so, ah. so I said, how do I start working but, here? A bo- boiler room reference. Oh, yes, right. <laughs> so I said, let me go look for these guys, see if I can find something. So I took my resume. On the cover of the resume, I put a joke. And on the bottom of the joke, I put, if, you, if you're laughing right now, this is exactly how co- clients are going to feel when they invest with me. If you want someone like this part of your team, give me a call. By the way, my resume had to follow on Hagen Dazs, Bob's Big Boy, Burger King, military ballets. That's no four year degree, oh, no two year degree. Though, Come on. Military no, helps out. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah. So I was 21 years old. I faxed it to 100 different places. Uh, 30 people called me back. 15 said, This is hilarious, but you don't qualify. 15 gave me an interview. And eventually I got three offers. I started off with Morgan Stanley Dean Witter out of Glendale. So, so 9 11 happens. Right. A day before 9 11 is my first day with Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. This is a Monday, 9 10. Start off with them, get my Series 7, 66, 31, 26, Life and Health. I go that route. And uh, start selling. Next thing you know, I go to Transamerica. I'm with them for seven and a half years. Then October of 09, we start our own insurance company. 66 agents out of Northridge, California. 66 agents. So Northridge, you California. your own insurance company. Fully. October of 09. I am 30 at the time. Okay. okay. So I look at the marketplace. I said, okay. Uh, no one's using social media in financial services. They're afraid of it. They're worried about it because you can't use it. You can't post anything. Everything with BD's got to get approved. Broker dealers are not approving these emails. All these things they're talking about, but life is still flexible. Right. Securities is not. I said, let's go do life. So we eliminate a lot of a securities gig and sure. we strictly focus on life and annuities. So we start off out of one office, Northridge, California. And the next thing you know, we grew from 66 agents to today. Uh, 10,500 agents, 49 states. Ah. De La Hoya is one of our investors. Gabriel Brenner is another one. Uh, Adelaide Fund out of New York is another one. It's a $2 billion fund. We raise it. Our convention's coming up in the next six weeks. Keynote speakers, oh, Billy wait, Bean. Wait, wait, we got to stop. We got to stop. Yeah. I got to go back. All right. This is, you have to tell, okay, you owe it to my, to my, to my people here. How the fuck did you, I want to know, hey, let's break down your strategy, yeah. right? If you could, let's, let's break it down. So like, I, I always think that like, well, it might seem like, how the fuck did this guy do it? Like it's a, in the end, there's always, you did some things that are duplicatable strategies. So 100%. Let's, start, let's yeah. start, slow it down. So tell me, what was, the, so you started in 2009? 2009, right. October of 2009. And how much money did it take you to start? $600,000. $600,000. Yeah. Did you borrow any? Or did you, you Zero. Borrow, All your, money. Your own money. So yep. you, you took the money you earned from financial services. You rolled the fucking, now was that like your last dollar or you had, or did you like put it all in the line or did you have some more in reserve? I probably had a little bit more, but I put, I, I said, I'm going all in. You put the bulk of your money. I put the bulk of my money in. Yeah. And you were, how old at the time? 29, 30. Okay. And married at this point? I got married three months prior to that. No kids yet. No kids got yet. Got it. Okay, good. Great time, right? Yeah. There's a lot of people watching or in that, you know, you can, it's almost as you get a bit old, you can always, you know, do things in life. But when you're that age, no kids, you fucking can afford to take risks, right? Yeah. So we, let me, let me tell you what happened though. You asked the question strategy that's going to be transferred to other people. This is one of them. I studied the industry. I literally sat down and I read every single thing I could on the industry, everything. Limra, every report, demographic, who they are able to recruit, who they're not, what clients are get, not getting any kind of service. So I looked at the whole do not call list. Is it doing good things to the marketplace? Is it doing bad things to the marketplace when it came out in November of 03? I'm looking at everything. The average agent at the time was a 57-year-old white male. Today, the average agent is a 59-year-old white male. So I'm looking really? at the market. Oh, yeah, insurance. I'm looking at the market. They don't know how to tap into the Latino community. There is no, they don't know how to tap into women selling insurance. It's mainly men selling insurance. They don't know how to tap into millennials. They're not fully understanding social media. They're afraid of social media. So I wrote a book. I wrote a book about specifically what our strategy was. That was the step, five points. So step one, in other words, you didn't just leap. You, you actually did some research. You identified 
a niche yeah. in the marketplace yeah. and you had a strategy to model someone and then, or, you know, typically like, you know, if there's some model that you use, then you improved on it or was it basically, was your model the culmination of all your research? Basically? No, my, I mean, my model was a model of five different uh, uh, people that I looked at. What right. I so was you watching. What, you took what you liked from one, from another, what another. Absolutely. Combined, and I, I will tell you what, what book had a big impact on my, on my business was Blue Ocean Strategy. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, Blue, I don't know if you read Blue Ocean Strategy. No. Highly recommend. I'll read it. A hundred percent recommend, especially now you're doing your podcast and what you highly, highly recommend the Blue Ocean Strategy uh, Four minutes. Tiffany, make a note. Four and a half million copies sold. The I'll guy that wrote it is W.C. Chen. You will not be able to put it down. Great. So I read the book and I'm like, okay, this strategy makes a lot of sense. So we need to eliminate, we need to decrease, increase, create. Perfect. This is what it's making sense. This is the direction we're going to go. And I looked at it in insurance. At the top, everybody was Caucasian. We need some people that can connect with uh, uh, millennials right. and, and minorities. I said, mm -hmm. that's the direction we're going. So we started going, by the way, today we're 54% uh, uh, Latino and 51% women. Our number one earner is a woman. Interesting. So you started, yeah. wait, you started with how many agents? 66. 66. How'd you start with 66 people? I was already known in the marketplace in the San Fernando, San Fernando Valley area. So you opened up your door. Like imagine New York is San Fernando. Right. Okay. okay. So in San Fernando, they knew what I was doing. So you opened up, you had 60 desks with agents there, or they working from yes. home, or they were just an office, 60 agents, 60 it's, phones. It's, it look at it as a Cobalt Banker, you got 60 realtors working with you. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So I had 66 agents. All right. And you took you took those from people knew you in the industry. So you basically These had- These are a, guys I had trained for seven and a half years. So you had a following. Yep. I had a following. Yeah. Okay. So you start with 66, 66 right? 66 agents. And does it just like right out of the gate take off like a rocket? No, no, no. Not okay, at all. No, not at all. Because right out of- I got sued on October 29th of 2009 from a $400 billion company, Agon. October 29th. Or what? for uh, uh, potentially taking clients. We didn't take any clients, 7,000 clients stayed. Interfering, we moved, tortious interference. Yes, right, right, right. Okay. August, which is nine, 10 months later, we settled. I've never been sued uh, in my life. That was the only time I got sued. So Wish August, I could say that, keep going. Yeah, so <laughs> August, we settled, we finalized, we started moving. And uh, from there, some, you know, the strategy was, I'm gonna start with California, then I'm gonna go Florida, then I'm gonna go Texas, then I'm gonna go Illinois, then I'm gonna grow and expand. Right. So we went one office, two, three, four, five, six, and now we're over 100 offices nationwide. Um, what did, what was your, you say, your biggest pivot? Like you had to, like, you know, typically when you're doing that, you're, you know, you make, you're starting and things are going with it. You make yeah. some little move and it just, was there one move that you made? 100%. What was that move? I can't move? even believe you asked that question. Yeah. So well, it's always, I, always I, like I was, that. I was uh, uh, so I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the comp plan. And a company's comp structure attracts certain kind of people. Your comp plan, whatever way you pay your people, thousand percent, it attracts exactly. So I'm looking at it saying, what kind of people does this comp plan attract? I change my comp plan maybe a hundred times, maybe a hundred times, could be even more. I kept changing. We're changing this this month. We're testing, so like test, test, test. Finally, I came out with this uh, comp plan in uh, September, I don't know what, September of, uh, 14 or 15? 15, 15, I wanna say, September, right. and I called it the Great Equalizer Bonus Program. <laughs> and it was five tiers. And I said, we're gonna try it for one month, then two months, then three months. The next thing you know, a guy that had only been with us for a year made 220, then 640, then a million. There you go, right. Then he made 3.3 million for, in, a, in two and a half, three years. And, and then, I was like, wait a minute, what the hell? So then everybody wow. followed this comp. Yeah, so yeah. the way you set up the comp gets the behavior that you want. There are a lot of companies I out there. I could not agree with comp. you. I always, see, by the way, when I, you know, I do a lot of consulting, right, for sales forces, I say some of the biggest mistakes are made in the compensation because if you have a, a, a comp and it's flawed, it, it disincentivizes people to work or just to have a few clients so and stop, true. right? So you yeah. have to almost make sure that someone just can't open a few big clients and then rest on their laurels, right? And then and likewise, also you want to have people that are tied to the company you build lawyer with residual right. income, right? So it's sort of this kind of dance you're doing with both. So That's you, right. you hit on this comp plan, right? People start making a lot of money and they just almost start like pouring in. It's just showing up your daughter for work basically. Yeah, and then at the same time in 2013, I'm a, I was a private guy. I'm like, listen, I'm not going to talk about my belief, you know, communist, or how I was raised, Iran, all this. I'm, I'm a private guy. I live my life. I'm going to work. I'm going to do my thing, libertarian. Leave right. me alone. Let me make my money. Just don't bother me. Um, I kind of started noticing that we're living in a time where everybody's naked. You can't hide today. It takes two minutes for somebody to know you're Republican. Right. That's all. You got to go on your tw Twitter account, Facebook account. Okay, this is what Jordan Belfort believes in. Got it. Next. Boom. Right. right? So I said, rather than trying to live a private life, I'm going to start creating content. So I was making content strictly privately for our agency, but I started doing it publicly. Right. Started a YouTube channel called it Patrick Bay David. Two years later, changed it to Valuetainment. 
And today we got 1.3, 1.4 million subscribers, over a billion minutes watched. Tell me this, this, this one thing I, 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 you have this one major hit, right? The 90, was the 90? That was on Facebook. Tell me what this is, the 90 Yeah, seconds. so, you know, I put the video on YouTube. It's what was called the title? Uh, Life of an Entrepreneur 90 Seconds. Bingo, right? That was I fucking, by the way. <laughs> it, it, as soon as I heard, I'm like, bingo. That's like just a catchy thing. Title, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so tell me, what, what was it? Yeah, so we put the video up, and what's so crazy, the day we shot the video is the day my father-in-law died, and I went inside, and my wife is crying. And I'm like, I gotta cancel this shoot. I don't even know how to handle my wife. I've never seen my wife lose, you know, her father. So she's a mess. She says, I said, I'm not shooting. She says, no, babe, you go do your thing, guys. I was a camera guys. Eight people are outside, six o'clock in the morning. You know, we're trying to set this whole thing up. She says, no, go do it. I know you guys are planning this. I said, okay, so we went and shot. I'm just like, I'm a mess the entire day. My mind is on the family, so I'm shooting. And we came back. These guys did a phenomenal job. We put the video up on YouTube. I said, let's see how it's gonna do. We called it the best motivational video 2015. I love it. I go to sleep. I wake up. It's only 2,000 views. I said, what a <laughs> flop, you know? <laughs> so then we go upload it October 31st at 3.13 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I upload it on Facebook, titled Life of an Entrepreneur in 90 Seconds. And then we go out there, uh, uh, what do you call it, Halloween trick or treat with right. my kids. Right. Two hours later, it's got 300,000 views. I go to sleep, wake up, 5 million views. A week later, 10 million, and then all of a sudden, 31 million views. So it's, it's, it just went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, by the way, that's a great feeling, isn't it? You know, it's Absolute, like that. It's like- Especially a, when you don't expect it. I know, it's a defining moment, right? Yeah. Then, so then you took that, right? And then you en ended up leveraging it to a book, right? I leveraged it to a book. So yeah. what the title of the book was? Life of an Entrepreneur, 90 pages. 90 pages, great. Yeah. And I'm sure the book was a huge bestseller, right? We, we did well, it did, the book did well, yeah. And, and how did that, in terms of um, your business, did it impact your business per se? Or was it a separate thing? Like, your, Is your personal brand integrated into your business? No, or? so here's what I don't do. You will never hear me do a call to action with my following to go into what I'm doing personally, never. You will never hear me. Matter of fact, let me give you uh, what took place a month ago. Uh, I told the vault, uh, the value team of followers, I'm gonna put a three day conference once we cross a million subs. Right. So we cross a million subs. And I put a three day conference in Dallas. We had two months to promote. I said, we're going to do it in Dallas. To my agency in the insurance company, I said, you are not allowed to come. So I put a conference the following week. I rented out the Cowboy Stadium. I put a conference the following week so it wouldn't, you know, kind of uh, confuse each other. So Valuetainment audience was one week. Then the PHP audience was the following week. We had people show from 43 different countries to the Valuetainment conference. And it was great. Three-day conference. I had Peter Guber there. I had... Uh, yeah. Uh, Phil Heath there. It was a great conference. So now our conference PHP is five weeks from now. I have President Bush there. I have Cl uh, Kobe Bryant come in. Jordan, that's going to be the one in five weeks. That's, that's uh, at the Mirai. Right. So yeah, it's it's. I've I've, I've separated the two because right, right. I want the integrity of both. That's worked very well. And and it both audiences have a lot of respect that there's no commingling going on. Two questions. We're we're, we're, we're over. Yes. I'm going to. Go a few more minutes. Lead the way. Yeah, lead the way. A couple questions were over, but you're an interesting dude. I love talking to you. So I'd love you to come back again. A um, couple of questions. Number one, for young entrepreneurs. Yeah. Right? What's the what's the best? Like, I'm not like what industry we choose. Just what's the advice that you would give? Like, you know, to a young guy, 20, 25 years old, right? Wants to go out, get rich, get, build a great life. What, what, what advice, just overall advice would you give them? It's, it's very easy for me. It's shadowing. Go shadow somebody. Go shadow somebody proximity that's very good. Proximity is power, right? But Not just proximity. Proximity is, hey, Jordan, can I take you out to lunch and spend time with you? That could be proximity. I'm talking about- Sticking by the, hey, and Hey, can them. I yeah. work for Jordan? Be your right-hand guy. Be a the movie American Gangster. You see Frank Lucas sees his boss, shadows him for 10 years. Then he becomes, you see this in business. You see this in sports. You see this, Steve Kerr is shadowing Phil Jackson, then he shadows Popovich. Now he's the best coach in the NBA outside of Popovich. There's an element of shadowing. So you got to find somebody locally where you say, look, I want to go work for this guy. And I'm going to spend three years with this guy and learn from him. So the idea is that, like, let's say, you know, you're, you're, you're a born entrepreneur, right? You know it's in your blood. Yep. But as part of that, like, there's a certain period of sacrifice to really, if you find the right men, someone that can, like, you can really, you know, kind of really tap into, right, and really learn from and grow with, there's nothing wrong with spending a certain amount of time there and really, become, you know, of, of those, those grooming years, right? I think a lot of people skip over that. They don't, they, not, they don't want to sit there and, and kind of be subserved to someone else. They even think of something, if you're in, like, you know, there's an entrepreneurial mindset to go work for someone else, but they're not mutually exclusive. In other words, it's okay to do it 
if there's an end game in mind, right? That you're, you know, you're not looking to be a lifelong servitude. Yeah. But to tap into whatever you need, but then eventually when the time is right and you know what you need to know, you have the connections, the respect, you go out on your own. Is that I, sort of? Absolutely. I'm, I'm all about, if you shadow the right person, you shadow the right person. And then for me, get to a point where you can have a power position with this person. Get to a point where you can get, I'm talking to the person that's absolutely ambitious driven. Sure. I'm not talking to the guy that wants to do a, a role playing type of position. I'm talking to somebody who says, I want to go be somebody and I want to go make tens, if not hundreds, chase the big dollars, but I want to be able to do it with somebody. You find like a lot of times somebody goes and works for a guy who's doing very well. He's known in the community. Say the, the whoever of different cities. Every city has somebody that everybody wants to work for. You go work for that guy. Then it comes to a point where you're like, I'm going to go do my own thing. It may not make sense for you to go do your own thing. There's a lot of people right now being billionaires, being entrepreneurs, not entrepreneurs. I, you, in certain industries, by the like financial service, you could tap into infrastructure. It's easier. Absolutely. To, no doubt about it. Absolutely. Even Balmer, look what Balmer's worth, you know, $30, $40 billion. Right. He never started anything. He worked with Gates. So positioning is critical, knowing where your strengths are. Uh, you know, this whole idea about I, I can be that guy. You can't be everybody. You got to know it very early. You cannot be everybody. There are certain people you and I cannot be like. There are certain personality traits. That, no doubt. No I, doubt about it. So the sooner you understand. Identifying your own strengths and accepting it. And yes. Then, right, yeah. So style, like I find, like, let's just say if I relate to your style, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm like his style. Then I got to work for a guy like you. Say a different style of selling. You go look at a guy's style selling that's very proper, right, you know, yeah, very, sure. you got to go to that guy. Somebody that fits your style that's killing it, then go shadow that person. And a few years later, you can make some decisions on where you want to go. I think that, you know, one of the things is important to point out with that is that when, you, when you're modeling someone, you don't have to necessarily take every aspect of them. You can extract very the true. best, right? Because I made that mistake. Because you're right, I've done that, and I did that, and I actually had some guys, some amazing traits, but he had some bad ones too, and I didn't realize I was young and naive, and I took sort of the whole organism. You can actually have one, two, three people, and so you did you had five, you said you had five entities, and you sort of pulled the best from each one, started your company, pivoted a couple of times, boom, took off. So I think the key is is that when you do what you said, because I think it's a great thing to do, but you don't have to always take everything from someone. You can take only the best traits and the ones that fit you and sort of leave, because no one's perfect. Everyone's got their flaws and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, one of the best advices I got many, many years ago was, uh, you know, sons and fathers or daughters and mothers go through three phases. First, they idolize, then they demonize, then they humanize. <laughs> so idolize, demonize, humanize. Oh my gosh, my dad's my hero. Dad, you're an asshole. You know nothing. You don't even understand what I'm going through. Oh my gosh, my dad's not perfect. He's a human right. being just like me. So yeah, anybody you work with, you're going to go through right. it. And the goal is to eventually get to the humanized phase because no one is going to be perfect. And last question, right? What do you think about 2020? What do you think is going to win? And, and you know, how do you view, what, it, like, does it concern you if the country takes a rapid lurch to the left? Or, you know, what do you think is going to happen? If you look at the pendulum, just go, I'm a, I'm a trend guy. I'm a data predictive analytics guy. This is why I'm bringing Billy Bean to our conference because I want to know data. I love baseball because it's stats. Right. I'm a stats guy. So president today is Republican, okay, Trump. Prior to him, Obama, Democrat. Prior to him, Bush, Republican. Prior to him, Clinton, Democrat. Prior to him, Bush, Republican. Prior to him, right. uh, you know, you can go Reagan and then Carter and then Nixon. And then, so you can go back and look at Ford and Nixon right. and John F. But Kennedy. But there's two terms versus one term. Exactly. Right, yeah. So if you're asking a two-term question, I yeah. don't think the left has got a solid candidate. I don't think Joe Biden's going to be able to face off uh, with uh, Trump. I don't see that. I think Bernie stands a better debate than him, debate-wise. Remember, not philosophy. I think Biden may be a better Democratic president than uh, Sanders would, but today personality matters, energy matters, being able to move and rally. You know, every time uh, Biden was in Iowa, they didn't show up to his right, camp, right. but but Sanders know how to rally people. So Sanders was even better at rallying than Hillary was. No, so, that, well, listen, you know, she was a flawed- Super candidate. delegate. I mean, she had it though. Right, she had it was, the super yeah, delegate. Yeah, it was stolen basically. Well, let me ask you a question. If there's one last question, right? I got to you're a smart guy, right? If there was a one piece of advice you could give to Donald Trump, that the, if there's one thing you could change, what do you think that would make him even more effective? One thing that he would uh, 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 change. Um, what I, at style? One, one, is there anything that you would change or not? Here's, here's what I would tell you. I, 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 okay, so for me, it is very hard to give advice on personality 
that's worked for somebody for 74 flipping years. There's nothing you can tell this guy. He's going to sit there and say, do you know how many broads I've been with? Do you know how many billions I've touched? Do you know how many people I've had dinner with? Do you know what kind of building? You have no clue who the hell you are to give me advice. With you. I really think he's not a guy that takes advice from anybody. I fully believe that. I don't think he's an advice guy. I think he processes with people. Like I think Hope it, it, Hicks was a good process. I think Sarah Huckabee was right. a good person. I think Kellyanne Conway was a good person to listen to him. But So he takes it in and uses his own internal mechanism. To I will decision. give one thing. There's one thing I will say. I will give one thing that in this negotiation that he's doing, uh, I think he's starting to realize the power of 5G because what it's going to do to self-driving cars and what it's going to do to speed up technology. And we're going to come up with technology better. And the fact that Huawei... Out of 188,000 employees, 75,000 of their employees are in R&D, research and development. We are, this this 5G thing's going to be bigger than people realize you, it. So You know, I'm glad you brought this up because yeah. I have not focused enough on it. I'm aware of it, right? But I'm actually going to research it because it's a, it's a very- I think a, a guy good, like it's an your important brain, topic, yeah. your brain, the way you're wired, like the way you explain Bitcoin like mm. them, your brain, the way you're wired, if you go down the rabbit hole of yeah, Huawei- Yeah, I'm going to, yeah. You are going to, it's going to be like 50 layers. Mm. And it's deeper than, by the way, today- uh, the, the CEO's daughter, isn't she still under- she, No, she was, man, uh, the CEO's daughter. In Canada, daughter, right? She's she got a, arrested in Is Canada. she still there or she, they released- No, no, she's back, but Google dropped the contract. There's 90 I know, right, right, days. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, yeah. the most important number there is 206 million uh, phones were sold last year, Huawei. They went from zero to 206 million in 10 years. They've never sold smartphones. They started in 1987. First time they sold a smartphone was 2009. 206 million they sold last year. Added the 206 million, 105 is in US, 105 is in China. 101 is outside. Google said, we're not letting you use the operating system. So right. they're going to they lose the whole million. Yeah, 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 so yeah, now yeah. they're designing their own operation. So they have to be very, as he's negotiating right now with China and using all of this stuff, he can probably bully Mexico that he's doing a little bit. And Mexico needs America right. tremendously. China's got 1.5 billion people. And if they all of a sudden come out, and I know Tim Cook was with Trump a few days ago. If they all of a sudden come out and say, listen, we're banning something you're doing as well. If they come and play that same game, and Huawei is projected, according to Business Insider, it's dropping 30 to 40% of revenues this year projected. They did 108 billion last year. They could drop 30 to 40 billion of revenues this year, Huawei. If Huawei's president, Ren, who is friends with the prime minister of China, because Ren used to be part of the Chinese government right. military. If he goes there and says, listen, look what just happened here, and they retaliate against Apple, mm. Little bit of this bullying tactic Trump is using could backfire on the economy. And then if the economy, like if Hillary wanted to play a manip manipulative game today, here's what I would be doing if Hillary wanted to play, like the whole dossier she wrote, this is what I'd be doing if, if Hillary wanted to play a manipulative game. She would go to China, try to figure out a way to convince them to ban any China companies from doing business with Apple, hurting U.S. economy by 20% because Trump can no longer use, look what the economy is doing today versus when I first got started. If Trump cannot use the economy card, he doesn't uh, get reelected. Yeah. You know what I think? I, I, I think my guess is, you know, back in like the days of Russia and the U.S. had this thing called MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. I have a suspicion that cooler heads are going to prevail here because China doesn't want an economic war because they, they're they trying to elevate so many people up out of poverty. I've been there, right? You know, you know, back in the 80s, it was the story was Japan's going to take over the world. Japan, 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 the rising sun, the movie, right? And it's so, what the fuck it happened? It was like zombie There's bags, a big right, difference, right? though. But no, their no, population shit, fair is enough, decreasing. Fair enough. Yeah. Right. But, you know, but, but my, there's something that, tells me that there's a little bit of puffery, like, you know, you heard about the empty cities yeah. being built and, you know, like this, you know, not everything is always what meets the eye. And I think that honestly, I think both sides need each other. hundred percent. So I, no I, I, yes, I, I don't, there's no question. I there. think that cool, yeah. I, my guess is at the end of the day, maybe I'm wrong. I think cooler heads will prevail. So I hope so. I'll say this, I'll say this final thoughts for you to be yeah. thinking about this one. I had a friend, very quiet guy. I was telling the story today while we're driving up here. He was five, four. 150 pounds. I love it. I'm fucking bigger than him. Yeah, he, I love the guy already. He was so, his name was so. One night, it's three o'clock in the morning. We're in the parking lot and a guy pulls up the car and he turns off the, we're living in a bad community at that. He pulls up the car, turns off the lights, points a gun at us. He says, hey, Holmes, who are you? What you doing, Mato? And then he looks at me, he says, oh shit, what's up, Pat? I said, the guy knew who I was, <laughs> but he points a gun at my friend, Saul. And my friends, my friends said, you don't pull a gun at me. I don't care who you are. He says, get out of the car. He says, no, I say we're good. He says, no, get out of the car. He says, I'm not going to punch you while you're in the car. 
He gets out of the car. He says, let me know when you're ready. Just let me know when you're ready. He tells him, warning, let me know when you're ready that we're going to fight. He says, I'm ready. He beats the living shit out of this guy. He's bouncing his head off the ground, scraping his face. Oh. Here's the moral of the story. Saul was a quiet guy. <laughs> Very quiet. Don't have to watch you don't talk to him. <laughs> China's quiet. Mm. That's all I'm saying. So you what? don't want to get him to the point peaceful. where, I, yeah, I, China, I, but they're peaceful, but yeah. you don't, cr like, if you go too much, there's no one that's going to take too much. So all I'm suggesting is maybe Good a little advice. bit of slow rolling is all I'm saying. Dude, you're a fucking legend, man. I appreciate it. And man. I'd love Thank you to you. come back. You're the best. Oh man. All right. It's a pleasure. Good to be here. Okay. Thank you. Okay.